Okay, the last time we talked about, because we wanted to get the elephant, if you will, out of the room, about how people, and when I say people, I mean Christians especially, are very concerned when it comes to ministering or sharing the word in reference to leading people to Christ. Really sharing the word, period, but especially when it comes to leading people to Christ. Um, we tend to, for lack of a better term, just be fearful. And I know that. Now, whenever I have done this before, I've never done it quite like we're doing it now. We're doing it now as a series. I always did it in the past as a class. And it literally was a class where you had tests and you had quizzes and, you know, I took you to task, trust me. <laughs> but I'm not doing it that way this time because I'm led to do it a little bit different. But I wanted to get that thing out of the way because I likened it to, um, now I'm a little bit older, so some of you may not remember this, but we used to go to class um, when we were in like primary school or elementary school, and especially for social studies. I don't know why they picked that subject, but all the time you'd be sitting there and the custom of the teacher was to call on you for you to have to read something out loud. Now, unless you just love doing that, sometimes you had a tendency to be sitting there, you didn't hear anything else that was going on in the class, because all you kept thinking about was her getting ready to pick you. And you were just trying to do everything. Please don't pick me, please, please don't pick me. So you didn't hear anything about the lesson. And the Holy Spirit brought that back to my remembrance to make me think when it comes to this subject matter, People may not be hearing anything because they're so dealing with the fact that they're so nervous about talking to people and have this fear. So I figured, well, you know what? Let's get it out of the way. So we did that and we started sharing scripture on it so that we could put that to bed so that you could see that first of all, it's not about you. It's about you just making yourself available. The Lord has given you everything that you need. And you know what? <laughs> I like to look at it this way. We're his representatives, right? Just like we know if you have family members, you don't even have to have children. It could even be your cousins or something. They all represent you. So if you all go out and you do something together as a family, you know you want them to act right. Like you don't, you don't want them to go in the restaurant and all of a sudden they get tired and start taking off their shoes and putting it on the table. I mean, you just wouldn't want that, right? Because that's representative of you. So you tell them something, or you, you'd say something, okay? Or you don't want your children, if you have children, to go into a restaurant and start running around and acting like what my mother used to call little Ubangis, okay? Because you would want them to represent you well. Well, you know, God wants us to represent him well. But here's the good thing. He's given us someone to help us so that we know to always do everything correctly. So it's not on us. It's not like we really have to sit there and try to have to figure it all out by ourselves. And I gave you some scriptures. We can't go over all of them again because then we won't move forward. But you can jot some of these down. Um, one of the ones that I shared with you last week was John's Gospel, the fifth chapter, verse 19. And then verse 30. So it was John 5, verse 19, and verse 30. Now, you know me, I'm going to have to share one of them with you. So I am going to read verse 30 out of the Amplified Classic Edition, because I really, really like this. And it says, I am able to do nothing, and this is Jesus speaking. Okay, so now if Jesus said this, we know we're not greater than our Lord, correct? Okay, and this is what he said. I am not able to do nothing from myself, independently of my own accord, but only as I am taught by God and as I get his orders. Even as I hear, I judge. I decide as I am bidden to decide. As the voice comes to me, so I give a decision. And my judgment is right just righteous, because I do not seek or consult my own will. I, am, I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself, my own aim, my own purpose, but only the will and pleasure of the Father who sent me. So when we are sharing the gospel in any way with other people, it's paramount that we remember to look to God and to trust his ability to work through us, okay? Exercise your faith when it comes to that. It might not be something that 
It's so easy for you. But you know what? God will meet you where you're at. Exercise your faith. Put your confidence in his faithfulness. And when you do that, he's able to bring the results <laughs> beyond anything that you will ever know. Now, your job is sim simply, and we talked about this, which was great, to plant and water the gospel everywhere that you go and leave the harvest up to him. Turn with me, and this I will read again. No, I won't. Well, maybe I will. First Corinthians 3, um, verses 6 and 7. And it's simply talking about how I'll read it to you out of the easy to read. And it says, I planted the seed and Apollos watered it, but God is the one who made the seed grow. So the one who plants is not important and the one who waters is not important. Only God is important because he is the one who makes things grow. And that is important because oftentimes, especially when it comes to leading people to Christ and especially if it's someone you know, uh, it could be a coworker, a family member, or, you know, your spouse, it could be someone that's very close to you. You really want to make sure that they get this. And if they seem like they're not, a lot of times we take it very personal and we get very upset. Sometimes people get attitudinal and all the rest of that. And that's not our job. Our job is to just plant and water. It's up to God who will make the harvest come about. We don't have anything to do with that. And I shared with you, and I truly mean this, and if you can wrap your head around this, it will really help you. When you stop to think about it, I don't care if you were in a position where you shared the good news of Jesus all day long, you still cannot save anybody. All you can do is share the good news, and it's quite simple. You never stretched your arms and died for one person. So therefore, you can't save them, but you certainly can share the gospel with them. So you will find that your abilities mean very little if you truly believe that God brings the results. And then we talked about when you get to a point where you start paying attention to how you feel, like, you know, I'm quiet or I'm shy and I get nervous around people and I really am kind of afraid and I don't really think I know enough and what if they reject me? All of that is you thinking about yourself. And I hate to break it to you, but you really are being very self-centered. Whereas you should be focused on what the Lord would say about the situation. And your thoughts then would encourage you to share the gospel because you would think like, well, God is not shy. He's not quiet. He's not afraid. He certainly knows enough. I mean, he's God. He is more than able. And God can do it through me. I just have to make myself available. And that's the key to me. You really do just have to make yourself available. That's why, and I shared this with you last week, you hear me say that in every single prayer when I stand before you because I know full well that Iva is the vessel, but it is the Holy Spirit speaking through this vessel to meet your need. It is clearly not me, but I yield to it and I make myself available. Praise the Lord. And it's important that you do the same thing. Because who you are is of no importance. Who God is in you is very important. Your ability doesn't mean much. God's ability in you means absolutely everything. Now, you have the privilege, and this is the part that I really get excited about, because I don't know if everybody thinks about it this way. When you are sharing the word of God with someone, you have the ability to work in concert with the Most High God. I mean, the only reason God chooses to use you is because you're willing and you make yourself available. But the fact that he chose you, I mean, that's the part to me that I just, it's overwhelming sometimes, that he actually would choose me to do anything. I just love that. So if God is not looking for people who are great, speakers or they're outgoing or they're real charismatic and they think fast on their feet or they're glib and dynamic. That's not who he's looking for. He is looking for any person who is willing to allow him to work through them. And I gave to you the scripture, and I'm not going to read this, but I gave it to you of Second Chronicles. Now I have to, because this is where we left off exactly last week. Second Chronicles, the 16th chapter, 
verse 9. And we went a little over time last week, so I didn't get to read it to you out of the expanded Bible. So I will read that to you tonight. The reason I've chosen this particular translation is because the expanded Bible, and I think I shared it before, it's extremely literal. So when they sat down with all of the um, original you know, Greek and Hebrew, the expanded Bible leaves nothing out. And I really, really do like it. So 2 Chronicles, turn there with me, the 16th chapter, and we're going to look at verse 9. Let me know that you have it. OK, praise God. So it says, the Lord searches, the eyes of the Lord search all throughout the earth for people who have given themselves completely to him, whose hearts are completely his, committed to him. He wants to strengthen them. Asa, you did a foolish thing. So from now on, you will have wars. So the question is not, do you have what it takes to share the gospel, but are you willing to have God work through you. Now, should you decide to make yourself available, you must choose to allow the Holy Spirit to work through you. It's about his thoughts, not your own. And that is, I mean, I cannot underscore that enough. You must realize it's not about you. Just kind of put yourself on the back burner. It's just about you being used by him. And these are some of the thoughts and some of the scriptures I want you to always remember. Turn with me to John's Gospel, and we're going to look at chapter 3, verse 30. It's really, really very simple. John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 30. And let me know when you're there. Okay. I'm going to read it to you out of the Living Bible first. And it says, he must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. I mean, that's kind of simple. And the Amplified says, he must increase in prominence, but I must decrease. And that's something as believers we know we're supposed to do all the time. We're supposed to get to a point where we become... I would like to think we're just like shells, almost, and we just allow him to just permeate our whole entire existence. Now, granted, that is not going to happen overnight, and it is something that we have to work at getting to, you know, to where we allow him to have total prom prominence. He's already in us, but the thing is, let's try to see, how can I put it? Okay, imagine you have a closet full of clothes, or whatever's in your closet. You may have a pair of shoes, that you reserve to wear, I don't know, I'll look at it this way, boots. Boots, you don't wear them in the summer. You know, you just pretty much wear them kind of like in the winter or when it's inclement weather. So sometimes they kind of end up being to the back of your closet. Whereas your slippers now, usually if you're like me, as soon as you get home, you take off your street clothes, put on whatever your clothes are of choice at home and slip on those slippers. And they are the most comfortable things, okay? So the point is, the slippers are more prominent than those boots that are in the back of the closet. So what we sometimes do, not all the time, and it's not even like we mean to do it, but a lot of times we have, we know that the whole Godhead is within us, but we have a tendency sometimes to kind of have that in the back of the closet, opposed to realizing it should be the most prominent thing in us. We are the ones who should be in the back of the closet, and we should allow the Holy Spirit and the Godhead and everything within us to be in the front, okay? I hope you, you got that a little bit. So that's what the scripture is telling us. The other thing I want you to see is Galatians 2. And you're going to look at, we're going to look at verse 20 together. Galatians 2, verse 20. And I know you're going to let me know when you're there. Okay, great. And it says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I myself no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the real life I now have within this body is a result of, of my trusting in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The Amplified says, I have been crucified with Christ, that is, in him I have shared his crucifixion. 
It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith, by adhering to, relying on, and completely trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So the point is he should be prominent in our lives all the time, not at the back of the closet, so to speak. Now I want you to turn with me to Colossians 3, and we're going to look at the third verse. Colossians 3, verse 3. Praise God. Oh, you're doing a great job. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I'm going to read it to you out of the Living Bible. And it says, you should have as little desire for this world as a dead person does. Your real life is in heaven with Christ and God. Now, I kind of think that's simple enough. And if it's not, <laughs> the Amplified says, for you died to this world and your new real life is hidden with Christ in God. So when I sit up and I talk about how we are royalty in a kingdom that's not of this world, that's very true. But in order for you to truly embrace that and put on your priestly garments and just walk in that royalty, you have to recognize that you, the person that you knew and grew up with your whole life, it died with Christ. It's of no big deal. Forget that. So that you can walk in that royalty. But you can't do that if you don't change your mindset. You have to change and develop a covenant mindset. And when you do that and that becomes prominent, nothing in this world bothers you. I mean, you know, you just <laughs> dust it off your shoulders and keep on moving. So I beg of you at this point, please don't decide to wait until you feel you have more to share the gospel, because that's something else people feel. Well, I don't know quite enough. I'm going to wait. I'm going to come to another class. I'm going to come to this. I'm gonna, you know, I have had, and this is not, OK, I got to be careful how I say this, because I don't want it to come across incorrectly. Hmm. OK, I'm going to do it two ways. You may have a person who's trying to learn how to swim. And they may go to every class that they have imaginable. They'll go to the YMCA. They'll go to you know everything that they can find out, the Red Cross, to learn how to swim. And they will keep going to class after class after class, OK? Uh, even my grandson, my daughter, <laughs> this was the first child. These commercials are perfect. The commercial of the first child and then the second child. OK, well, this was the first child born. And they took this child to swimming classes. And when I tell you the tuition that they spent, you would want to slap her yourself. <laughs> because I'm like, are you kidding me? OK. The baby wasn't even two. And they were getting ready to go to Barbados. And they didn't want him to have any concern about the water. The concern is, don't go. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, really? I mean, you know. But this is the first baby. So we're going to spend this astronomical amount of money so that he can become accustomed to the water. And here are these adults giving up their weekends because they have to go to the pool with this little baby for him to get accustomed to the water. And I mean, they spent a lot of money. I mean, you know, a lot. The child never learned how to swim, <laughs> OK? Because, I mean, it's just what it, But for them, they felt that they needed to do this. OK. Well, there are people, when it comes to leading people to Christ, who have sat in every class that I have had on this, okay, to the point where they can teach the class, I am sure. But if I ask them, how many people have you shared the gospel with? If they can tell me five, and this is from 2005 to now, which is 12 years, it would be a lot because they too are just waiting until they have more information. I don't know how much more information they want to have, but that's what they're waiting for. And what I'm saying to you is, please don't do that, okay? I submit to you, and this is why I'm sharing it this way, because maybe I should have shared it with some of them and, and they would have looked at it this way. You will not have more until you use what God's already given you, okay? So please not, please don't develop that someday theory, okay, of I'll start sharing the gospel someday when I feel more confident, or I'll start sharing the gospel someday when I know more scripture, or I'll start sharing the gospel someday when I get my life together now, please. <laughs> Some people, if that were the case, 
Mm, that would not be a good thing. So if you entertain, though, this theory, I'll be honest with you, someday we'll never come. On top of that, the only way you will have more tomorrow is if you share what you have today. Amen. That's a fact. So I am sure you will remember this story. We all know this story. Um, turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, and we're going to look at chapter 25. And this is the parable or story of the talents. And I know we're all familiar with it in some way, shape, or form. I'm going to read it to you out of the Living Bible, though. And we're going to start with verse 14 out of Matthew 25. Let me know when you're there. OK. Starting with verse 14, it says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going into another country who called together his servants and loaned them money to invest for him while he was gone. He gave $5,000 to one, $2,000 to another, and $1,000 to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities, and then left on his trip. The man who received the $5,000 began immediately to buy and sell with it and soon earned another $5,000. The man with $2,000 went right to work too and earned another $2,000. But the man who received the $1,000 dug a hole in the ground and hid the money for safekeeping. <laughs> now I'm gonna pause right here because this just occurred to me. It's a little funny but I thought of it anyway. You know how, maybe you all don't know, because again, sometimes I feel like I date myself like I'm so older, but you know how there's the good china and the good crystal that goes over into the china cabinet that you take out when? Once a year, maybe, okay, for Thanksgiving, because we're saving it, okay? Or you have this beautiful silk scarf that somebody gave you. See, I, I see I'm getting some people to look, so I know I'm not the only one, okay? This beautiful silk scarf that somebody gave you, and it's, it's nicely wrapped in your closet, and you're saving it. What are you saving it for? I mean, really? Are we supposed to have your memorial and maybe you want to wear that? I mean, come on. We need to stop that. We need to celebrate the time we have and utilize it. Take out the china. If, if you can't eat off of it, what are you saving it for? OK, so that just came to me. So anyway, it just shows you how my mind is so extra special. So starting with verse 19. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to him to account for his money. The man to whom he had entrusted the $5,000 brought him $10,000. His master praised him for good work. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, he told him. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Begin the joyous tasks I have assigned to you. Next came the man who had received the $2,000 with the report, sir, you gave me $2,000 to use and I have doubled it. Good work, his master said. You are a good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over this small amount, so now I will give you much more. The man with the $1,000 came and said, Sir, I knew you were a hard man, and I was afraid you would rob me of what I earned. So I hid your money in the earth, and here it is. But his master replied, wicked man, lazy slave, since you knew I would demand your profit, you should at least have put my money into the bank so I could have some interest. Take the money from this man and give it to the man with the $10,000. For the man who uses well what he is given shall be given more, and he shall have abundance. But from the man who is unfaithful, even what little responsibility he has shall be taken from him. And throw the useless servant out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what does that say about you wanting more? You need to take what you have, be grateful, and use it. Okay? Now look at Luke's gospel, because this is the other thing I want you to remember. Luke's gospel, the 16th chapter, and the 10th verse. Are you there? 
Okay, so we're going to read this out of the New King James Version first. And it says, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. A clearer way of saying it, the Amplified Classic Edition says, He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is dishonest and unjust in a very little thing is dishonest and unjust also in much. So my question to you is why would God give you more if you are not using what he's already given you? Now something else that Minister Scott shared with us this past Sunday um, that I thought was just wonderful and it could encourage us to just rest in the fact that the Holy Spirit will always help us, especially when it comes to leading people in Christ, is found in John's Gospel, the 15th chapter. So let's turn there. We're going to look at verses 26 and 27. John 15, 26, and 27. And let me know when you're there. Okay, good. So the New King James Version, and you know this already, says, but when the helper comes, and the traditional King James Version always says comforter, okay? So when the helper or comforter comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you will also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. The Amplified, I like it because it explains who the helper really is, okay? But when the helper, comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby. Oh my goodness, I love that. That <laughs> comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the spirit of truth, who comes from the Father, he will testify and bear witness about me. But you will testify also and be my witnesses because you have been with me from the beginning. Now, I'm gonna share it with you out of the message because this just cuts through all of it and makes it super clear. When the friend, meaning the Holy Spirit, I plan to send you from the Father comes, the Spirit of truth issuing from the Father, he will confirm everything about me, meaning Jesus. You too, from your side, must give your confirming evidence since you are in this with me from the start. So the point is, we have to share our point of view with people as well. The Holy Spirit is in us. He's going to help us. He is going to, one of the things that I used to, and I'm going to put it to you this way. One of the things that I used to share with my children every morning before they went to school, because I recognize that teachers sometimes give pop quizzes, you know, and they may not have necessarily, it's a pop quiz, so you don't know it's coming or they may have had a test coming, you know, midterms, finals, all of that. And the thing that's so interesting is they all did this, they all prayed this prayer even in college when I was no longer there and it, it blessed me and brought me to tears because my daughter prays it with my grandsons and I mean, they're not really having tests and quizzes, okay? But still, she speaks it over them and I appreciate it. And this part of the prayer, it's a long prayer, but this one part was that the Holy Spirit will bring back to your remembrance what you have studied, learned, and need to know so that you will score high on your tests and quizzes, bringing honor and glory to him. The point being is he can't bring back, the Holy Spirit is not going to bring back to your remembrance something you don't know. So this is why you're here, praise the Lord, and this is why you must continue to study. You need to know what it is that he said so that he can bring it back to your remembrance. And the thing that's so wonderful is he is faithful. He will do just that. Some scripture that you, you know, you, you may not think, well, I don't know this one, I don't know. You'll be talking to somebody, it'll come to you as clear as a bell. He will bring it back to your remembrance. Yeah. But it's remembrance. You cannot remember something that you've never read. You cannot remember something that you don't have any knowledge of. So that's why it's also it, be encouraged to study so that you can have something be brought back to your remembrance. Also, while you're already in the book of John, turn with me to the 16th chapter, and we're just going to look at Verse 15, and I'm going to read it to you out of the expanded Bible and then the message. But the expanded says, and you're there, right? Yes. Okay. All that the Father has is mine. That is why I said that the Spirit will take what I have to say, what is mine, 
and tell, announce, declare it to you. Now, I love the message, so I have to read it. It says, and the message, well, I should say it this way. The message actually backs up to verse 12. So it's 12 through 15 out of the message if you're taking notes. And it says, I still have many things to tell you, but you can't handle them now. I love that because think about it. We can't handle it so much. <laughs> but when the friend or the Holy Spirit comes, the spirit of truth, he will take you by the hand and guide you into all the truth there is. That's why it is so important to be filled with the gift of the Holy Spirit's evidence by speaking with other tongues. So he can do just that, take you by the hand and guide you through the word and make it illuminated and clear to you. He won't draw attention to himself, but will make sense out of what is about to happen and indeed, out of all that I have done and said. He will honor me. He will take from me and deliver it to you, which means, again, he will take what is, ha all right, we know that it's this realm that we're living in now, okay? We talked about that last week. We always talk about this three-dimensional realm, this earth realm, where we're looking at each other now, we see it. We also know in juxtaposition to that is the spirit realm. Okay, where God is seated in the throne, Jesus is on the right hand, okay, side of the Father. That is very real, okay? Here's the point. The same way that we're functioning and we're communicating, don't think that they're sitting up there in silence. This is God. He is communicating too. Here is the key though. If there is something that he is saying about your life or something that he wants you to know, who is he going to use to give you that information? He's going to use the person or the office of the Holy Spirit. So you need to understand that. That's why, again, it's so precious to have that gift to overflowing of the Holy Spirit evidence by speaking in other tongues because you can get the wisdom of the Most High God imparted into your life immediately because you've got that channel open. Whereas if you're just born again, that's nice, okay? But you don't have that because you're not speaking directly. You're not being able to pray a pure prayer because you don't have your prayer language yet. So you don't have all that God has for you. You just have part of it, okay? And that's why, again, and I'm not trying to jump ahead, but that's why it's so exciting because we're going to have the opportunity to not only lead people to Christ, but give them the whole enchilada. In other words, we're going to lead them to Christ, but then we're also going to share with them that you can have this precious gift of the Holy Spirit. One should go hand in hand with the other, and we're going to be able to do that. And I think that that's so exciting because, like it says right here, he, meaning the Holy Spirit, will honor me, meaning Jesus. He will take from me and deliver it to you. Everything the Father has is also mine. That is why I've said he takes from me and delivers to you. So it is so important. We need to have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. So moving forward. I had to decide, okay, since this isn't a class, how am I going to present this whole thing to you? Now, you've heard me oftentimes say, good, better, best, never let it rest, your good is better and your better is best. I try to actually live by that. Um, so I was like, okay, I already explained to you and shared with you, I want you to be so comfortable that you can lead people to Christ while you're standing in line at Starbucks, okay? But that's not, God's best, because you're just standing in line at Starbucks, okay? So this is the analogy that I came up with. <laughs> if you, if I'm gonna teach a young woman, okay, a young bride, she's just getting married, okay? And she comes to me and she wants to know, okay, I've gotta now provide for my husband and I don't really know, you know, <laughs> how to cook and stuff, what am I supposed to do? Now, I could teach her how to do something quick, like, you know, here, you can make a little snack, like you can get up in the morning and you can make oatmeal with hot water. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then you could give him some grilled cheese and soup for dinner. I mean, okay, that might last for a little while. <laughs> you know, that's a cute little snack. I mean, he, he would eat, okay? Or she can learn how to make a little quick meal, you know, like, okay, let's make some spaghetti and meatballs or some pasta. You know, that's a little bit better, okay? Then I could say, I'm going to teach you how to really make like a royal feast, like at Thanksgiving, okay, where we're going to have turkey and ham and candy yams and macaroni and cheese and hot rolls and, you know, and you get the picture. The point is, if I teach her 
how to prepare that feast, he's not going to be hungry because she's got enough in her arsenal to be able to come home and fix him a quick meal. Whereas if all she knows how to do is the little instant oatmeal and grilled cheese, it's kind of rough, okay? So what I decided to do was I'm gonna share with you the feast. And then after sharing you the feast of how to lead people to Christ, then we can break it down to a quick meal or a little snack, like if you are in the line at Starbucks. Does everybody follow me? Okay, good. <laughs> All right. So with that, I also want you to know, now in case you didn't know, most of you, well, I don't know, I can't say that. Any of you who were born again, coming through the counseling department of Crenshaw Christian Center New York, you should have gotten the feast, okay? That should have been what you received. And I would like to believe that that is definitely what you received, the feast. And it's important that you also know that because if you ever invite somebody here, you need to know that if they answer the altar call, that they're gonna get the feast. They're not gonna get a snack and they're not gonna get a quick meal. The good news is when you finish this series, you will know how to prepare that feast and it will be up to you however you choose to do it because I am more than willing and I'm going to share with you everything that I have shared with the counselors. Now the great news for you, and this is where you should really be rejoicing in case you don't know it, is you don't have to take the test and quizzes, okay? You don't have the homework because trust me, the counselors, and I can speak for Melody because she was one of the first who's been here from the beginning. I took them to task, okay? And they had homework, which was graded. They had tests, they had quizzes. And I will also say some people who wanted to be counselors were not because if for some reason or another, they weren't able to prepare the feast they weren't able to be counselors. And that wasn't me being mean, but it's because of how much this is so important to me. And for those of you who didn't, if you weren't here for the first part of the series and you didn't hear my testimony, you may think that's being harsh, but if you heard my testimony, you'll know why it's so important to me. So try to get that CD if you did not get it. So with all of that being said, turn with me to John's Gospel, the 15th chapter, and we're gonna look at verses 12 through 15. Now, I'm also gonna take my time with this. I'm not gonna rush through this because I want you to own it. I want you to know that you know that you know all of this material and be comfortable with it. Fair enough? Amen. Okay, so John's Gospel, the 15th chapter, we're gonna look at verses 12 through 15 and let me know that you were there. Okay, and it says, this is my commandment, and this is Jesus speaking, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father. I have made known to you. The Amplified says, this is my commandment that you love, and he breaks down what that love means, and unselfishly seek the best for one another, just as I have loved you. No one has greater love nor stronger commitment than to lay down his own life for his friends. We in this country, use the word friends loosely. Everybody's my friend. I don't use it loosely. Once I understood that the word friend is a covenant word, okay, because Jesus laid down his life for me, okay? If you are not willing to lay down your life for a person, that's an associate. That's not your friend, okay? I have friends that I can count on one hand. That's about it. I know a whole lot of people, okay? But I don't have a whole lot of friends because I'm not willing to lay down my life for a whole lot of folks. I'm really serious. I mean, I guess if I consider my children, I could say I have two hands. But I'm just saying, you get my drift. So we need to stop so loosely using that word. Another word we have to stop so loosely using is love. 
Love is a covenant word, okay? You can't love a pair of shoes. I'm sorry, they're shoes, they're comfortable. You may appreciate them, you may enjoy them, but do you really love them? I don't think so, okay? So they're just, we just have to start fine tuning because that's again, being prominent with the spirit of God in our lives and not having him back in the closet somewhere, okay? So with that being said, verse 14, you are my friends if you keep on doing what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you my friends because I have revealed to you everything that I have heard from my father. And lastly, we're gonna read it in the Message Bible that says, I've told you these things for a purpose, that my joy might be your joy, and your joy wholly mature. This is my command, love one another the way I loved you. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on the line for your friends. You are my friends when you do the things I command you. So that's letting me know too, if we're not doing what God has commanded us to do, then how, I mean, we're not his friends. I mean, we really are not. I'm no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what their master is thinking and planning. No, I've named you friends because I've let you in on everything I've heard from the Father. Now, the reason why I read this to you and spent so much time on it is because we know that we're supposed to love one another. We know that. I mean, you know, you can go into super church and they can tell you that, the little kids can tell you that. But we need to understand the gravity of what that means. And the foundation of leading people to Christ is that you must have the love of God in your heart. Because I'm gonna tell you something, if you don't, everything you say is just a bunch of words and it means a hill of beans. It does not mean anything to them. It's not gonna pierce their heart. And the Holy Spirit is not going to be able to speak through you because we already know that the Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We also know what? That God is what? He is love. So if he is love and we are not acting in love and we're not being loving, he cannot work through that because it is true that oil and water don't mix. Light and darkness don't mix. So if you have an attitude or you have whatever issues you have and you are not walking and acting and displaying love, I'm sorry. It's not going to come through. It's like the Holy Spirit is like, okay, I'm going to wait till you're ready. Okay? So we have to understand that. And that's the first thing and the most important thing that you need to know. Because I can give you scriptures. You can sit and quote the whole entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. If that love is not present, you are not going to reach anybody. And I submit to you that sometimes the reason why people that you think should have already accepted Jesus have not if, if, you know, if they've had somebody share the gospel with them, maybe they have them share it in a pious way where they're talking to them or talking at them and they're coming from a level where they think they're up here and then they're just spouting out words to them. And that's how come it's, it means nothing because it never reached their heart because it didn't come from the person's heart. So that's the first thing that I really, really want you to think about and pay attention to. The next thing is turn with me to 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and the first verse, and I will confirm to you what it is that I just said. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. In the New King James Version, it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass, or a clanging cymbal. The Amplified says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love for others growing out of God's love for me, then I have become only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, just an annoying distraction. And that is what a lot of people are. There are some people, bless their hearts, who will hand out tracts from now until you know sundown, or until the moon, whatever, however you want to say it. But if there's no love present, they are like a gnat. They're annoying to people. Nobody wants to be bothered with that because people aren't going to respond to that. But they're going to respond to love. Right. And I, <laughs> I have to quit because I just ran out of time. Oh, my goodness. 
Wow. Thanks for joining us. Our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. If you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. We now offer the convenience of text and online giving, one of the most secure ways to give. Try it now. Simply text East G from your smartphone to 28950 and follow the prompts. You can even specify a designation for your gift. Text East G for general donation, East T for tithe, or East O for offering. Each transaction needs to be its own individual text message. You can also visit our website, FrenchRChristianCenterEast.org, and click the Give tab to begin your experience. Set up recurring donations or give one-time gifts. This experience is easy to use, secure, and requires a one-time registration only. Giving the second time is even easier. Simply text East G to 28950 with all your information securely stored. We appreciate your continued support and stand in agreement with you for the manifold return in your life. Thanks again for watching. And remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. We would like you, our viewers and partners, to join us in honoring the legacy of the Apostle by making a donation to the Apostle Frederick K.C. Price Library. The library will be on the grounds of the Faith Dome in Los Angeles, California, and it will be open to the public. It will be a place of study, learning, and research, available for anyone desiring to further their knowledge and understanding of the Christian faith. Visitors will also have a chance to learn more about our founder and his impact on the body of Christ and the world at large. You can mail your donations to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. If you are giving by check, be sure to designate in the memo area, Apostles Library. If you have Crenshaw Christian Center envelopes, you can mark AL on the envelope. You can also donate via your smartphone by texting East AL to 28950 and follow the prompts. We thank you in advance for your support. And as always, we stand in agreement for the manifold return in your life.